All right, Matthew chapter 7. Thank you, Charlie, for standing in this morning. Appreciate that. Matthew chapter 7, please, in your Bibles. I'm preaching a Christmas message this morning, and I, I'll just give you an honest reason for it. The reason is that I'm just not good at preaching messages that have to do with special days, with uh, special things. Our first uh, service in our church back in 2006 was on May 14th. That was Mother's Day. And I tried to preach a Mother's Day message. And I think that's about the last time that I made a, a noted on purpose effort to preach a uh, holiday type message in church. Now many times the text of the scripture that we're preaching coincides uh, with the appropriate time of the year and so forth. But if you came this morning to hear a good uh, Christmas message, my, my apologies to you. I will be preaching about Jesus and uh, that's pretty much what Christmas is about, so you could connect the dots there, and hopefully that will be sufficient for you, and hopefully it will be for, sufficient for you to simply say Merry Christmas, and uh, I'm so glad to see each of you here today. I was afraid nobody was going to come to church today, as many people as left town, to be completely honest with you. <laughs> it would be Mrs. Price and myself and a, like one or two other people. I was going to really preach at them about faithfulness. And, you know, because you always want to preach to the people that are there, right? Matthew chapter 7. Will you please look down in chapter 7 of Matthew to verse 13. I want to read through a series of commands in Matthew 7. And uh, then I will, uh, actually we're going to just read uh, 10 verses, 13 through 23. Then we'll pray and we'll introduce our message this morning. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves, so ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good free tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now this uh, is a portion of the scripture that I believe invokes a lot of questions in people's mind. Won't you agree with that this morning? And a matter of fact, this is a passage of scripture I believe, which in, in many instances is used as a tool to cause men uh, sometimes to doubt whether or not Jesus is their Savior and God is their Father. And that is not the intent of the Scripture, and we're going to look at it uh, just a little bit carefully this morning and see if we can find help and uh, find some things that will uh, instruct us. Let's pray. Father, I just ask this morning that you would grant to us the understanding that we need to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. God, I thank you for your word. And this morning, we do not want to focus on what is not said so much as what is, is said in the Scripture. And God, I pray that you would help it not to be uh, man's opinions and help us not even to approach the Scripture this morning with preconceptions. But instead, I just pray that you would grant to us understanding of your word as it is written. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, here we are in a portion of Scripture, and it really is going to end in this division, or this chapter division in your Bible. Uh, this portion is the orientation, if you will, of Jesus with His disciples. Uh, this would be the section, or included in the section, that many people call the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and, or the Beatitudes. So Matthew chapter 5, the Bible says that, uh, Jesus, you know, he, he was he went up into a mountain, he sat down, his disciples came unto him. And he began to open his mouth and began to teach them, saying, and then he said, blessed are the poor, blessed are the blessed. All the things that contradict what the world thinks blessing is, Jesus said this is what it is to be blessed. 
But I want to emphasize something, particularly if you haven't been with us as we've been preaching through Matthew. I want to emphasize something that is, is very, very paramount, very important uh, to comprehending truth. And that, that, is there, that there is a difference between being a disciple of the Lord Jesus and being born again. Unfortunately, this passage of Scripture by some has been taken, and the things that Jesus said are requirements for disciples. Individuals have preached as requirements for eternal life. And I have to say to you that if there are any requirements that are levied on the disciples that were also requirements for eternal life, I don't think there's anyone in the world who ever has or ever could make it to heaven. I have something else that we emphasized as well that is worth the mention this morning uh, in our introduction is um, not only is this written to disciples, but you know, you could be a disciple, and we're going to see this in our text today. You could be a disciple and yet not be a child of God. In other words, discipleship is not salvation. Discipleship is following a master or being a learner or one who is taught by the master. And I want us to have in our minds a very clear and distinct difference between being born again and being a disciple. You see, we have a really good illustration, don't we? And it is not uh, by accident, I think, that uh, God gave us Judas, who was one of the disciples, and yet was a man who ultimately was lost and betrayed the Lord Jesus. And so there is a warning here to this select crowd that is sitting before the Lord Jesus, and He's given them a number of warnings. He's given them a number of commands, like, for instance... Ye are the salt of the earth. Like, uh, ye are the light of the world. And uh, given them some things that disciples are supposed to be characterized by and things they're supposed to do. He has also qualified some things in his series of commands. For instance, uh, Jesus made very, very clear. He said, I came not to destroy, think not that I came to destroy the law. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus, my friend, is the fulfilling of the law. In other words, Jesus did not come to invalidate what God had previously required. And by the way, a law cannot be performed. A law is not something that you do so much as it's something that you don't do. And so uh, the Bible says very, very clearly, God used the Apostle Paul to tell the, uh, the Galatian church that the law is a schoolmaster. And it, it educates us about our need for a Savior. It shows us that we are sinners, that we're lost, that we're sold under sin. And so that's the purpose of the law. And Jesus is the only person who ever came that did not break the law, but instead fulfilled it. Good. There are many statements about our Savior that describe why He came. Even the people, even sometimes His disciples misunderstood why Christ came. Many instances, they thought He came for the sake of national Israel to set up a kingdom and so that that kingdom uh, could, uh, so that God's chosen people could be uh, reassembled from around the earth and could be freed from tyranny. And they really had a very short-sighted view of the needs of mankind. Wouldn't it be tragic if a king came for Israel and the kingdom was, was uh, set up, God's people were delivered, and then the king died? What would happen? Kingdom is only so good as its king. And what we needed more than a national uh, deliverance, my friend, was a Savior of the world. Jesus Christ came for that. Oh, He's going to come someday and deal with those kingdom matters. Remember when He, uh, for 40 days, taught His disciples the things pertaining to the kingdom of God? It's in Acts chapter 1. And they asked Him the question, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What did He say? It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath placed in His power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. And so, God has those plans. But my friend, that isn't why Jesus came. And you and I, if we're going to understand why we live, you and I need to have a very, very clear understanding of why Jesus came and what Jesus wants of us. And the question this morning that ought to be asked each week is, uh, are you a disciple of the Lord Jesus? Well, let's look at some characteristics Today, first of all, Jesus talks about uh, talks about the way of a disciple. Verse thirteen: Enter ye in at the straight gate. That's interesting. 
uh, the, the straight gate is uh, the same kind of word that you use like for calligraphy pen. It's kind of a sten stenograph or a stenography, uh, like a, a pen that a person would write a narrow line with. And so it's a contrast here. Uh, and the guy idea of gate would be an entrance or even a porch. Uh, enter ye in at the straight gate. And then Jesus said, For wide is the gate, and broad is the way. So there's a contrast between wide and narrow. So the straight gate is the one you're supposed to go in. With the wide gate, wide is the gate, and broad is the way. The Bible says it leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Now, my friend, don't always use this for a good measure, but you know, it seems as though normally the majority is wrong. It seems that oftentimes when someone says, everybody says, or everybody thinks, that that has nothing to do with whether or not the thought is valid, isn't it so? You know, everybody can be thinking, everybody can be saying, everybody can be doing, but the reality of it is, is what everybody's doing oftentimes is wrong. Now, <laughs> I have met some believers that, uh, you know, anything anybody's doing, we're just against it because, you know, if they're doing it, then it must be wrong. Well, that isn't the manner or the mindset of a believer, but the idea here is, is that the way to eternal life, the path to eternal life is very, very narrow. Matter of fact, it's so narrow that Jesus explained it this way in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The last three weeks, not this past week, but the three weeks before that, that I've spoken in the, in the public school of Shamir's class, the question has come up, why is it that people say that Jesus is the only way? The teenagers, some of the teenagers, and I think some of them believers in Jesus, they really have an issue with Jesus being the only means for eternal life. That seems to them to be sort of narrow. They seem to think that God has not really included enough uh, ideas in that or enough differences in opinion in that. But my friend, the reality of it is, is that Jesus is the only way because He is the only means for forgiveness for sin. Sometime if you have time to waste and you're not uh, uh, using it mindlessly watching some sort of media or something like that, do some thinking. And try to figure out a way that a holy God who has never sinned, that you want to judge sin accepting your own, could forgive your sin without Christ dying, without a perfect sacrifice for sin. You figure out a way that a just God could forgive sin without Jesus dying on the cross, my friend, you'll come to see there's no other way. You ever tried to think of an alternate redemption plan that reflected the character and holiness of God? Just try to think of what could God do if Jesus didn't have to die. Do you think that maybe God valued the life and the blood of His Son? You don't think it was at a whim that God said, okay, my son will die for sinners. My perfect son will die for sinners. No sacrifice on God's part. You think it was just some kind of a, uh, a, a cosmic disturbance for Jesus to die? No, my friend. God gave His son. It was the most costly sacrifice that could possibly ever be given. And God did so. And then individuals have the audacity to say, why does it have to be Jesus? <clears throat> How many times have you shared the gospel with somebody and had them say something like, well, I don't mind going directly to God. I'm gonna, if I die, then I'm just going to, you know, they think they're going to stand before God. And the Bible says we're going to bow before God. But I'm going to stand before God and we're going to work things out. We're going to have a conversation about it and everything's going to be just fine. Well, you don't have a concept or a notion of who God is if you think that you'll stand in His presence first. You don't have a notion of who God is if you think that you'll negotiate with God and He'll overlook something that is absolutely abhorrent to Him that is your sin. Jesus is the only way. Mm -hmm. And Jesus herein is telling His disciples, enter ye in at the straight gate. 
For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few be there, there be that find it. I have in my living room at my house a picture uh, painted by a lady whose maiden name was Brenda Godby. And it is an illustration. It has a picture of, it's just a massive amount of people, and they're all walking, and everybody is walking this way, walking towards you, uh, you know, as you're looking at the picture. And as everybody's walking, there is, on the ground, there are some chains attached to some shackles which are empty or just laying on the ground. And you see a narrow pathway between everybody walking, and you see a lady going the opposite direction of everyone else. And it's a good illustration of this passage of Scripture. See, a lot of times, you know, you see the picture of, you know, the, the, you know, the path of life, and you'll see, like, you know, this trail going up a mountainside or something like that, and that's the narrow way. But my friend, actually, in reality, the narrow way is actually a path which is going in the absolute opposite direction of where everyone else is going. Sure. It's in the same place. It's in the middle of the same road, but it's going the opposite direction. I love it when Paul uh, tells the church that we are not to go all together out of this world. You know, we live in a real world of lost people to whom we have the responsibility uh, and the burden of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ who saves. And we're preaching that that gospel in the face of those that are on the pathway to hell as we're going in the opposite direction. And if you can grab a hold of people that are going by and get them to reverse their direction, to get them to go the straight path, the straight gate. My friend, this is not works that Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is not saying be better than everybody else. My friend, I don't have a prayer. I don't have a hope if that's what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is, take the only path, the only way. No gospel would be understood well without explaining it the way that Jesus did to Nicodemus, would it? When Nicodemus came to Jesus, and Jesus told Nicodemus, He said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The straight way, the straight path is a path to God, my friend. And the path to God, the means to that path, is the cross of Jesus. Jesus illustrated it, you know, using the serpent in the wilderness. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And He's speaking of His cross. Speaking of being lifted up to an open shame. Lifted up as sin for sinners. Lifted up to bear the wrath of God, which should be against us, but God's wrath against Him lifted up on His cross. And Jesus said, you've got to look to Me. Look to Me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The straight path is the cross of Jesus. The straight path is the cross of Jesus. My friend, that's the only way. It's the only means to find eternal life. And the Bible says that there are few there be that find it. You ever, you ever pause and reflect over uh, what it might be like in heaven? Here's the best I know about heaven. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man. So the best I can think about heaven is nobody's ever seen anything Nobody's ever heard anything, and no one's ever imagined anything like it. That's the closest I can relate to heaven, is that I cannot. You ever think about that? Isn't that wonderful? Now, I don't try oftentimes to paint a picture of heaven for people. I don't try to say, well, heaven is like, oh, we can, we can talk about streets of gold. Can you relate to streets of gold honestly? Could you honestly? We talk about gates of, uh, of pearl and walls of jasper, you know, diamond walls. Could you relate to that honestly? Could you? I mean, we just, the, the scale is entirely lacking in us beyond the magnificence. But, so the Bible just simply says you can't relate.
to heaven. When I reflect on it, I think about sometimes, though, what the people must be like. What it must be like to have, ultimately, when everything is said and done, to have the new Jerusalem, you know, up over the, the new earth. The new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and that city. And we're able to go up in, in and out of, you know, in and out of heaven. And it's just going to be magnificent. I, 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 can only, I can only relate to the earth part. I can't relate to the heaven part. But I can relate to people to some degree except for being in glorified bodies. Do you ever wonder how many people will be in heaven? Do you ever wonder how many people have eternal life? There are a lot, aren't there? Amen. There actually are a lot. Um, it's amazing how you can go anywhere almost in the world and find believers. You really can. And I, I love that because you can meet people you've never seen their face before, but you know them, don't you? I mean, you just kind of know them. You, you, know, you know their experience. You know how they were saved. You know the kind of a God they serve, so what God's doing in their life. And there's, there's just a fellowship, isn't there? I can meet someone I've never met before, and it's like we're family. I, I don't know how many times people have visited our church and they've ended up staying the night at our house. Like, how do you meet a stranger and have them stay in your house? Some of you have never met before and they stay the night in your house, in your home. How many of y'all have done that? Mm -hmm. Most of us have. Many of us have, haven't we? Why? Because we're family. Mm -hmm. Family that's never met, but because of that bond that's in Jesus Christ. So I can think along those terms, but I have no idea how many people will be in heaven. But I would venture to say it will be in the millions, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. I would venture to say. I have no idea how many people God will say. What do you think? You, you figured it out? No, I'm just... Didn't, didn't God say that it would be like the stars of the... And the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. Well, that's what Abraham's seed would be like, isn't what, is that? that the not talking about people well, a lot of Abraham's seeds going to hell. Oh. So, if if you're referencing that, I don't know. Oh, I thought that, that, that was that talking be, about the saved people. I think it's referencing the, the descendants of Abraham. So, yeah, and so that's and so you took me right where I wanted to go. Thank you, Tony. You'd be like trillions uh, if that were the case. Yeah, you know what's hell going to be like? So hell going to be like, I think hell will be crowded, I think heaven will not. To put it that way, I, I don't think that crowding it would be a feature of heaven. Ever look at just the description of the, of the city, of Jerusalem, how it's, you know, 1,500 this way, that way, it's a cube, 1,500 high, 1,500, you know, wide, long, and the, the light of it is the sun. And it's, it's, it's neat to look at the description. I, I don't, in my, in my mind's eye, see it as overcrowded. I see it as a lot of people in proximity. But hell's going to be overcrowded. The path to destruction, my friend, the Bible says, is broad. And I cannot emphasize that enough. What's the application for we who are here today? Well, first of all, you must be born again. That's the first application. That's practical, isn't it? Except a man be born again. He cannot enter the kingdom of, of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the only means to the straight gate we see is Jesus Christ. What is the application for those today who are here who have believed in Jesus? Well, my friends, sometimes I think it is that we fall into the trap of believing that there will be some sort of a positive outcome for people who don't receive Jesus. We need a reality check sometimes. You know, it do, does us good sometimes to have visions of hell. I have no idea what hell's like, and I don't put much stock in people that people's accounts that say they've seen it. I don't believe anyone has. But it's good for us sometimes to just have visions, to see faces. My wife, one night, we had a neighbor, and we were always trying to win our neighbors, and it's in the place that we used to, to live. And... Uh, there's a lady that if you wanted to end a con she was the she was the we lived in a condominium and it's a 55 and older condominium she was the condominium gossip if you all lived in a condos you know the lady I'm talking about don't you and so she wanted to come and she wanted to tell you something and then she wanted to get your opinion about it so that she could twist your opinion and then tell other people what you said you know what I'm talking about that was the, the lady that's what she did and so she'd come and you would we liked her she was a nice lady uh, she would come and she'd stand outside our door and she would tell you something and wait for you to say something. I didn't have anything to say about whatever's going on in the neighborhood. 
really. And I knew if I did say something, then it would be <laughs> tweaked a little bit and then told to everyone else. And so I didn't want to say anything to her. Sometimes it was hard to get out of conversations because it would go on and on and on. If I ever wanted to enter a conversation, into conversation with her, I simply had to start telling her about Jesus. He would say, well, what about eternal life? And got to go. She's gone. She didn't get angry. She didn't get mad. But you just, when you talked about spiritual things, she was gone. And uh, she got cancer. And uh, my uh, wife was really burdened about her. Went to share the gospel with her several times. And she just, just didn't want to hear it. Just didn't, didn't want to hear about Jesus. And my wife woke up one night and she saw her face. And she had a vision. You know, not, My wife's not having visions. Don't, don't worry about this. But she was just dreaming about hell and the torment of hell. And she saw this woman's face. And she went one last time. She said, I've got to go talk to her again. We'd moved away. And she had been the person taking her. This lady had, had cancer, so she was taking her on her doctor's appointments and all these things. And uh, she went and tried to talk to her, and it just, just couldn't lead into the gospel at all. So before she left, she said, you know what? I want to tell you about Jesus. And the lady said, I was hoping you'd ask me about that. The very lady that every time you tried to talk to her about, don't worry about me, I'm good, whatever, and then I'm gone. You know, she's out of there. And she, gets, she was born again. And you know, my friend, it makes a good illustration, actually. It makes a good application. If you would see how broad the path of destruction is, and you would recognize how many people that you pass every single day that are on that path, we as believers ought to have a burden for those that are on the path of destruction. And there is the application in this passage of Scripture for those who have received Jesus and are on the straight path and on the narrow way and they're going in that gate. My friend, remember those who are not. Oh, God can save the lost. I want to tell you, I'm, I am, I, I've had the experience so often that I'm a believer, but I'm always amazed at how powerful the gospel is. So I, I, I'm at a place, I think, in my life where when somebody tells me that person won't get saved, I'm a scoffer of what they say because I've seen people that won't get saved get saved so many times. But you know who I haven't, been, haven't seen born again? are people I haven't witnessed to. People I haven't tried to intercept on that broad path to destruction. You and I need to just see the eternal perspective of the pathway to hell. And that's what Jesus is illustrating for the disciples herein. I wanted to go through two more sections, but I, I don't have time here. There's a warning about false prophets. And... Uh, it's an important warning, but we won't look at it this morning. I want to look at one more thing if you'll go with me down to verse 21. These are related commands or related comments that Jesus is teaching His disciples about, but they're, they carry their own context. Verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now we have a lot of illustrations actually of how true this is. Do you remember when uh, people were trying to cast out devils or the people were trying to cast out devils in the name of Jesus and the devils mocked them, laughed at them and then chased them and they ran away uh, they ran away naked. You remember in, in, is it, I think, let me turn there real quickly. I think it's in Acts uh, chapter 16. Um, Sorry, I, I'm using a new Bible and it just doesn't... Uh, the pages are stuck together. Um, yeah, verse Jack 16, uh, verse 16. This is when uh, I believe they were there with, you know, with Lydia, that the, uh, the apostles were. Verse 16, It came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination... No, no, that's not it. That's not the one I'm looking for. I'm looking for where uh, the lady follows the men saying, uh, these men are servants of the Most High God. That's the one. That's is, that, is that her? Verse, uh, seven, verse 17. 17. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah, that, I'm sorry. Thank you guys. Good to have you guys here. Verse 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, friend, if that isn't Lord, Lord, I don't know what is. Is it? In other words, Paul... And the ministry team that's traveling with him, Luke and others, 
are preaching the Gospel. And while they're trying to preach the Gospel, this woman with a devil in her is following them saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. Uh, now, can you imagine trying to talk when somebody's saying that? Jonathan did this one time uh, to Brother Taj in our church. It was really funny. When Taj first came here, uh, he was trying to ask Mrs. Price a question like from across the room. And every time he'd ask the question, it was uh, during the playoffs a couple of years ago, and Jonathan would go, what time the Spurs play tonight? Nine o'clock? So Taj, Taj would say, Mrs. Price, and he'd try to ask Mrs. Price a question, and Jonathan would go, what time the Spurs play tonight? Nine o'clock? You guys know Jonathan. You know, every time he tries to say, what time the Spurs play tonight, 9 o'clock, and we realize he's doing it on purpose. <laughs> After a while, he's just trying to keep Taj from being able to talk to Mrs. Price. It was really, really funny. But this wasn't funny. Paul's trying to preach the gospel to lost people. And while he's trying to preach it, this lady says, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And you can't get much done. Now what she was saying was spiritual, wasn't it? What she was saying was absolutely the gospel truth, literally, wasn't it? And yet as she said it, it was a distraction from the need that she had, which is that she had not received the way of salvation. And Jesus here says, if you'll go back with us to Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says very, very plainly, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Ah, oh, pastor, you know, if you don't do God's will, you can't be saved. Is that what the Scripture is saying? I've, had, I've seen it taught. You can read the Gospel according to Jesus and you'll see that that's taught. But my friend, I have to say to you that we know what the will of God is. You ever read it in Timothy? God. Who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth? And my friend, God's will is for you to enter in at the straight gate. That is the cross of Jesus. To receive Jesus as your Savior. And it's as plain as the nose on your face to anyone except for someone who would perhaps want to go the broad way. See, the means for salvation is as narrow as it can be. And you know... You say, Pastor, you know what? It'd be nicer if it were broad. No, it'd be complicated if it were broad, actually. You ever think along those terms? You know, people think, oh, you know, narrow minded, narrow, narrow. I just want to tell you something. There's not a person born that narrow isn't best for when it comes to the options for salvation. So I don't need a smorgasbord of choices for eternal life. Not only do I not need it, my, my friend, it's nothing more than a confusion. For me. You ever think about how good it is that the gospel is simple? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's good that the gospel is simple. The gospel is not a simple prayer, my, my friend. The gospel is a simple heart's attitude. And that's as, as simple as it can get. I've seen people before have people pray prayers, and I think the person praying that doesn't even know what they're saying. They think it's a prayer. And the gospel is not as complicated as a prayer, actually. The gospel is as simple as recognizing you're a sinner in need of a Savior and that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, was buried and rose again. And it's as simple as the gospel is a free gift and just saying, God, okay, I've got that. I want it. I want it. I've had people say, well, you know, you have to really mean it when you believe. Well, here's a question for you. How much do you have to really mean it? I'll tell you how much. Enough to ask for it. That's how much. God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want the free gift of eternal life. And if you want that, my friend, that's how simple the Gospel is. That's what is intended by the understanding of the narrow way, the straight path. It's a simple path. The broad path, boy, you could go this way and that way, and you could end up over here and over there, all over the place. And there are people who are trying to take the broad path, my friend, and they're going like pinballs trying to get eternal life. From this to that, you ever met the person who is a sampler of religion? Well, I've seen people who come to church before. I've, I'll tell you, they're the hardest ones to win to Jesus because they've tried everything. 
They're, they just, just open to anything. And they're the people who are the most confused and the most lost. And they can tell you about Confucius and they can tell you about Hinduism and they can tell you uh, about any kind of a religion and they have, believe that everything is valid and they know nothing works. Because they've never gone the straight path, the simple way. They may say things like, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Thy name? And have we not in Thy name, and in Thy name cast out devils, and in Thy name done many wonderful works? They can point to what they've done, but they never went in the straight gate. I'm not a big fan of anymore of Pilgrim's Progress. I loved it when I was growing up. But when I read uh, John Bunyan's conclusions about the Gospel, he makes the Gospel something other than the, what the Bible actually says it is. But I like the illustration of entering in at the wicked gate. Where people jump over the, they jump over the wall and they get on the path, but they never came in the gate. Mm. They may be on the path, but they're not born again. You've got to go through the gate to get born. It's a good illustration. It is only an illustration. It's an allegory. It's one that is much reverenced by most believers and, and there's a lot of help in it, but it's only that. Hear me now, friend. You may be an individual that I could ask the question, have you been born again? And you could tell me about the things you've done. A couple of weeks ago, we knocked on a door. Brother uh, Nicholas and I, we knocked on a door and a big tall guy looked out the glass window and he wouldn't open the door. And uh, he said, what you want? I said, I'm Ryan. I'm here uh, to invite you to, to our church and I want to make sure that you know you're going to heaven. Something like that. And he said, oh yeah, thanks, good. He said, I'm a pastor. I said, are you born again? And he said something like you could have gone all day and not said that. And he turned around and walked away. I knocked on a door a few years ago and a man told me he's an organist in a church. I asked him, do you know for sure that you have eternal life? And he said, please, I'm an organist. I'm the head organist in our church. I've been the organist since, and I mean, he was like 60. He'd been an organist for like, I think, more than 30 years, almost 40 years in his church. Lord, Lord, I played the organ. I've asked people, have you been born again? And they say things like, I pray every day. Who do you pray to? I pray to Jesus. My friend, if you've never been born again, you've never gone in the straight gate. And Jesus here is emphasizing, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord. Oh, there was a disciple who was revered above the disciples, was he not? Judas was the most well-respected of the disciples. When Judas said something, every other disciple agreed with him. You remember when they broke the alabaster box, the woman did and anointed Jesus, and Judas said, why wasn't this sold to feed, you know, and the money taken to give to the poor? And the other disciples said, you know, boy, Judas, he's a sharp cookie. He's right about that. Oh, he looked good to everybody. Judas was positively the most religious of the disciples, if you look at his life. He called Jesus Lord. I can't help but think that as the disciples, of course it would be more than the twelve, but as they were spread in front of Jesus and as He is teaching here, I can't help but think that as He is saying this, that He paused and His gaze perhaps rested. I know this is only in my imagination. But He paused and His gaze rested on Jesus when He said, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. You must be born again. There's a narrow way. There's a broad path. The people on the broad path are going the wrong direction. And their destination is eternal destruction. There are people on that broad path that are saying, we're on the same path you are. I'm, I'm the same as you are. I think, I hope not. We don't need more of those. Tony? 
There's a, a verse in John 6, or two verses that say, Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he had sent. Doesn't that say the same thing? Yeah. Yeah, that is the work of God. A lot of people want to do a different work, don't they? I don't need to believe in Jesus. I Look what I've done. Look what I've said. In verse 23, the Bible concludes, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Notice this. Ye that work iniquity. Now, what is the working of iniquity? Well, that's wickedness, right? What's the work of iniquity in this context? The work of iniquity would be the good deeds that a person would do if they were a real disciple of Jesus. It's very similar to our righteousness being filthy rags. Mm -hmm. The good things you say about God, the good things you do for Jesus, if Christ is not your Savior, my friend, are the works of iniquity. Literally, the things that you believe that God will accept instead of Jesus are the things that God hates more than anything else. We're going to end there today, and we're going to simply take the application. Let me just make a, a short time of conclusion. We did have a passage in between we didn't get to look at this morning for sake of time. I just want to say to you, Christian, it isn't complicated to be a disciple of Jesus. There isn't a series of commands that you must obey. You just take this book and when God speaks to you in it, you just do it. What it really is is that there's a Savior that you must know. And He's an exclusive Savior. You may have a problem with God for saying that Jesus is the only way. But my friend, your problem is with reality. Because Jesus is the only way. Sure. And if you're wrestling with that, I would urge you to get that thing settled. And one of the things that you'll find when you accept that Jesus is the only way is that you'll be glad at the simplicity of the way. And I'll tell you something so wonderful for me to know that I, I cannot know everything and I do not need to. I just need to know Jesus. And anyone can know that. Anyone can know Him by receiving Him. If you're here this morning and you haven't received Jesus, let me tell you something that will help you. God's Spirit. God's Spirit right now will be saying to you, to your heart, He'll be saying, you're not my child. You know it. I know it. Whatever these people think they know about you, it isn't so. You know, and I know the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. When I was... When I was a child, I did business with that reality. I had someone challenge me with that truth in a way that I couldn't answer. And I came to a place when I just had to simply say, God, I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I want you to be my Savior. I don't think those are the exact words. I was led in a prayer, but that's what my heart said. And you could just simply say that to God. God, I want Jesus. I want the narrow way. I want the only way. I want Jesus to be my Savior. My friend, God will save you just because you ask. Here this morning and you're a believer, it may be that you've become a God critic. I've met people that I think they know Jesus as their Savior, but they're a little critical of God's narrow-mindedness. They're a little critical of the narrow way. My friend, the narrow way is the only way going in the right direction. Would you do business about that this morning? Would you just simply say, God, I'm glad it's the narrow way because anything else would be too complicated for me. Besides, we're so prideful about our intellect, aren't we? You ever compare yourself and your intellect with God's? The narrow way is the only way for me. I need an easy one. And it is easy. See, so you enter in at the gate. You enter in at Jesus and His cross. And my friend, you just go in that direction. Right up the middle. Right against the flock where everybody's going the opposite direction. Father, I pray that you would increase this truth in our hearts. Bless and move in the invitation, we pray in Jesus' name.